teaching STEM and science for, as you can see on the screen, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And it embraces a way of thinking about science education. Um, traditionally, really, we've taught, um, taught things in pigeonholes. We still do. Um, science in one area, technology in another engineering in another, maths in another. And the idea of STEM teaching is that if you want to be a successful scientist in the 21st century, um, you cannot teach these things in isolation. They have to be taught um, together. There has to be overlap. And most importantly, um, uh, what lies behind STEM is an idea of communication and collaboration that really the top and most successful scientists in the 21st century um, will be able to work with each other, to collaborate, to listen to each other um, and to draw skills from different disciplines um, if they are going to succeed. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so you might ask really why we need to think differently about teaching science in the 21st century when over the last uh, um, um, several centuries we have had seen um, extraordinary developments in science that, that have achieved, achieved incredible things. So what's, what's different and, and why do we need to start teaching science differently? Um, Arguably, we are experiencing something that is called uh, the fourth um, industrial revolution. And really, this involves the development of um, technologies that will completely change um, the way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we manufacture things, the way that we do business. We've already begun to see it um, in our lifetimes. Um, um, you know, when um, I was at school, the internet didn't even exist. So, um, in fact, even when I started teaching, it was only just beginning to emerge. And that has changed things radically. And things are only going to change more radically. Um, and the sort of technologies that I'm talking about are advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, um, and, and wearables. And these are going to transform um, the way we live. Um, we've already seen it with things like 3D printing. Um, there are going to be developments in the way that energy is stored, in genomics, um, in advanced robotics, in autonomous vehicles. Um, and the World Economic Forum in, 19, in uh, sorry, 2015 um, identified some tipping points, the points at which these new technologies will really impact um, on our lives. Um, and it, it surveyed 800 high-tech specialists and they determined um, some of the following dates. Who knows, of course, exactly how accurate these are, but this is what they predicted. That by 2022, 3D printed cars will exist and 10% of people will be wearing interconnected clothes. Um, 2023, we'll see 80% of the world digitally connected. 50% of internet traffic will be directed straight to home appliances. By 2024, we'll be transplanting 3D printed organs, such as liver, and by 2025, implantable cell phones will exist. Um, and this is going to change things dramatically. Um, one figure suggests that 65% of children in school today will work in jobs that at the moment don't exist and that we probably really cannot um, imagine. Arguably, it's going to lead to the loss of large numbers of jobs. Estimates say up to 75 million jobs may be lost from traditional industries. But the good news is that they reckon up to 133 million jobs will be created by new technologies um, that will come. But the chil our children have to be prepared for those um, in the right way and educated in the right way. Um, arguably, all of these figures uh, m may be meaningless and, and may be inaccurate. But what they do point to is that we cannot know the future. We cannot know really what world we are preparing our children for. Um, but we do know that they're going to have to be lifelong learners because things are going to change and they won't be able to rely on simply what they've been taught in school. And they're going to have to be um, adaptable and resilient to change and have a really broad portfolio of skills um, if they are to flourish um, in the 21st century. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so, what do we need to teach children? Well, 
ultimately, um, we need to teach them that knowledge um, is a blend and it, and it can't be um, pigeonholed in the way that we traditionally do that, that we traditionally do. And that's actually really quite a challenge for us because all schools in the UK and, 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 and really across, across the world um, tend to teach things in pigeonholes. So, you know, you learn poetry and English and algebra and maths and maps and geography and the digestive system in biology and the periodic table and chemistry. And we do that largely because that's where our exam systems take us. They are examined separately. And of course, our timetables, therefore, are geared to delivering um, information that allows them to, to pass exams. Um, and don't get me wrong, that hard science, if, if we're talking about science subjects, that hard science is important. They have to be good scientists they've got to learn the basics um, but anybody that um, is involved in the world of work indeed anybody involved in life um, will know that that knowledge does not sit neatly in boxes so we have to encourage children to think about learning and knowledge as a whole um, across those more traditional divides um, as I said before, it's very, very important that children learn how to learn because they will not stop their learning journey um, once they leave school. So in school, we have the, the traditional model of the teacher that imparts knowledge that children learn and then reproduce in an exam, but that's not going to be um, enough for our children. They're going to have to learn the skills to learn for themselves. We've seen a huge growth um, in online learning materials, even, even completely online degrees in the last few years. And this will be the way forward, I'm absolutely certain, um, as, as um, our, our children have to keep learning throughout their working lives. So it's really important that in school, we equip them with the skills of how to learn, how to answer a question for themselves, how to find, to, to trust, themselves um, to have the ability to, to teach themselves effectively. Now, of course, they must have all the support to do this while they're in school, to, to research a topic on their own, to find answers. They need to be supported and scaffolded at school, but when they leave us, they should have the skills to do that themselves. We also need to teach them um, knowledge literacy. Uh, the internet is, is a wonderful thing. If you want to find an answer, that you pop it into Google and you'll get not just one answer, but sometimes a million answers or more, um, which is fantastic. But they've got to learn what are good answers and what are not good answers, what is good science and what is not good science. Um, so teaching them to be um, selective uh, with their learning and with their knowledge and how to pick the best knowledge, that's a really key skill they need to learn too. Back to the real principles of STEM, communication and collaboration. And this is absolutely vital. Very few of the world's major problems are going to be solved by a single person working on their own um, in, in a science lab. Um, they're going to be solved by groups of people with different ideas and different skills that they can bring um, uh, to the problem. So it's very important that good scientists learn how to communicate their ideas um, with each other. Um, they need to communicate to their peers. They need to work in collaboration with their peers. They need to listen to their peers, understand their peers' point of view and, and, and their constructive criticism and be able to act on it. And most importantly, they need to be able to communicate their ideas to their financial backers, to their, the audience, the person for whom they are producing the product. They've got to be able to market their product. So we have to teach our children how to communicate, how to work with each other and how to communicate not just with each other, but publicly to be able to stand up and present their ideas. Um, and then we have to teach them creativity and innovation. And again, this is a vital 21st century skill. Advances in science have been fantastic. Um, and, and what it's meant is that actually science is accessible to perhaps more people than it used to be. 3D printing, single board um, computers, all of these things mean um, that actually more and more people are doing science and it'll be those scientists that have that extra bit of creativity, the ability to see an answer to a question um, that no one else has, 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 has spotted, to come up with something that really meets the needs 
um, of people. Um, and it's, it's sort of back to that Google idea of 20% of, of spent not on your core project, um, that in, in the hope that somebody with a really wacky idea will, will hit the jackpot. Um, and, and while that's possibly a bit black and white, that idea of, of allowing students and encouraging uh, creativity, thinking outside the box, um, that's really important. Um, there's no doubt that COVID has taught us many, many, many things. Um, but but what we will what we will see from it, of course, the science. We pray we'll find us a vaccine. We'll find us quick and effective testing. Um, but without all the skills required to um, finance the project, the logistics of distribution, um, the political um, persuasion, um, uh, the convincing the public of the, the safety of whatever is produced and so on, without all those skills, the science can't flourish. Um, so we need to teach our children um, a rounded and, and a broad portfolio of skills. Can I have the next slide, please? So how do we teach them? And this, this comes to the heart of it. And of course, um, like many things in education, it's, it's really hotly debated. Um, universities for some time have been using things called maker spaces, where people come together, scientists, um, artists, um, economists, they come together, they discuss their ideas, um, they create the science, they make it, they make it something tangible, um, they build it, they rebuild it, and they get it 100% right. And there, there are, so these maker spaces are designed for um, exactly that. In schools, the thinking is to give pupils real life problems, come up with something to challenge them that there really are, um, are no issues to. How do you make a car travel 500 miles on a, without recharging its electric battery? Um, can you come up with a really useful, good looking gadget that will help people with arthritis open those pill bottles that need pushing and twisting? Real life problems for real people that need real solutions and encourage them to be as creative about the problems, the solutions to them as they can. Um, insist that they work on these in groups, um, um, te make them work with their peers, listen to their peers, learn from their peers, um, learn them to be good, teach them to be good collaborative um, workers. Tell them who they're producing their, their product for, who their challenge is meant to meet, what is their audience, because that is vital too in the real world. Um, if you're coming up with a solution, it is for somebody and you need to think what those people will actually want from their product. Um, and lastly, give them the skills um, to, to market their product, to stand up and talk about it. Ask them to stand up, to present, to convince, um, to convince their audience that um, their product is worthwhile. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so Marlborough, College has a bit of a history of, of innovation um, and, and thinking differently. Um, we uh, introduced business studies as a, as a whole new subject. Um, we were fundamental in the teaching of the, um, a new maths curriculum. Um, and actually, when our last science centre, well, our current science centre, um, was built in uh, 1933, um, the master at the time said, and it, it's not quite the same, but it does ring, it does ring true to me. He said, even in 1933 young scientists and their teachers need plenty of space and light and a temperate climate to do their best work i believe they will have this i hope that our new building will be a great incentive to good work and and he was on to something there it is not just the science that matters um, they need the right space the right environment to be able to think and work effectively um, and very excitingly, just short of um, 100 years on, we are looking at major changes to our um, science provision at Marlborough. So we are completely revamping um, our science block um, to give the most um, the state of the art teaching of, of core science. But we're also building something very exciting called um, the Innovation Centre. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, and it will look something like this and it will be um, a direct walkway from our science block and the idea of the innovation center is that it will give exactly the sort of space that i was trying to describe for children to carry out practical applied stem 
learning. So they'll learn their science, uh, the, the real core of their science in, in the science block. Um, and, other two, and, and they will learn art and geography and history and, and um, RS and philosophy and English and all those other skills too. And then they will bring them together um, in this, what we, will, what we are calling our innovation centre, um, where our computing department will also uh, be housed as well to allow the science and computing and then all the other art skills to come together with these kind of collaboration spaces where they can build uh, their ideas, they can bring them to reality, but also with collaboration space for talking, for discussing, for designing beforehand, and then with spaces specifically designed for presenting their ideas. And then um, collaboration really lies at the heart of this. Uh, because the aim is to bring in all sorts of partners to work with us. Businesses, the local community, um, anybody interested in collaborating on a project with pupils at the college will be able to come in and use this space. Um, and this will be ready, we hope, very much. Building is well underway by Easter 2021. Um, and we are really looking to it to revolutionize our delivery of um, science to, to create a real, really collaborative um, STEM project um, and STEM space at the college to um, equip our children with the skills, all the skills that I've described to allow them to um, uh, achieve in, in science and um, in the 21st century. Um, can I have to I skip a slide because I've talked through the next one and then just to the end slide. Um, yeah, so if you just go to the end slide. Um, uh, and that's it for me, um, really, about STEM teaching um, and, and what we're doing at Marlborough. Um, I, I hope that was uh, I hope that was useful. Um, but I'm very happy now to answer um, any questions that you may have um, about Marlborough General or about how we teach or our boarding or or anything else, really. Great. Hi, Julia. Thank you for that. Thanks for your presentation on Marlborough College as well. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll uh, start asking some of them right away and. Uh, feel free to answer uh, to your capacity. Um, the first question we have coming in is, uh, a lot of viewers would like to understand the admissions procedure for kids uh, that are applying to Marlboro College, um, especially for those uh, that may not be coming from a UK system, like a French system sure. or IB or even homeschool. Uh, what is the procedure yeah. for that? Okay. So first of all, to reassure you, we take we have 189 pupils um, in a year group, and we but we will take pupils from well over 100 different feeder schools into any one year group. So we really have a huge range of children that come to us um, from um, all over the world, um, from the independent sector, from the state sector, from international schools, homeschool children too. Um, so we really do have um, a broad intake, you know, and 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 an increasing number of children will come with financial assistance too so there really are children from all sorts of different backgrounds so we try very hard to make the admissions process as fair as possible um, for those children who may not have come through um, a traditional prep school route so the way that we work is as follows our main point of entry is um, in year six um, we do have, we do keep a small percentage of places for children that come late to the process in year seven and year eight because life isn't simple and families' lives change and and as an international community you'll know that uh, more than most um, so we, we reserve spaces specifically for children who come late but our um, our main process takes place in um, year six where you need to enrol with us by um, uh, mid October of year six um, and this is for entry into year nine sorry to be clear because we start in year nine um, and then th what we would do is ask your child to take uh, what's called the ISEB pre-test now this is a um, it's a skills test so it's not knowledge based and therefore it should be fair across all curriculums and, and all teaching it doesn't depend really on what you've been taught it, it should be a cognitive test um, I'm aware because we've been running it for a few years now that, that some children despite the fact that we ask parents not to prepare them for it, are, are clearly um, well prepared. So it is only one part of what we look at. Um, we will also write to um, 
your child's current head teacher and ask for a reference. And again, I'm very aware that, that children at, um, at prep schools will have, will have very all-rounded references. Children coming from a different background um, may have slightly different ones, but we send a very structured form to try to make sure that we get all the information that we need. Um, and that's a very important part of what we do because we're very aware that a child's current school will know them far better than we can help to know them. If your child's homeschooled, we would take references from tutors or from sports coaches or whoever was in a position to be able to give us more information about the child. So we have this sort of cognitive test, we take information from the people that know the children best, because that's very important. And then we run an assessment day where in the normal run of things, we ask all children to come to us across one of seven days in the January of, of um, year six, they come on one of those days. Um, we're really hoping this year we can still do that. It may have to revert to being, to being virtual. Um, but on those days when we ask them to come to us, it's as much about a child looking at us as it is about us looking at them. We hope to get to know them a little bit better, um, but we also want them to get to know us a little bit better as well to make sure that they're comfortable with what we do. So on that day they would come, um, uh, we'd give them a welcome and a drink and a biscuit. They do two very short writing tasks for us. They're not assessed. One's a questionnaire about their interests and the other they write us a little story based on a picture that they've got. And all that happens with those is they go to the interview with them that they're going to have as prompts. We don't mark them, they're simply to make the interview run a little bit more smoothly. They will then go off and have, um, we give them a good lunch, or they meet some of our older pupils and they can have a chance to chat with our prefects. They go off and meet the housemaster and housemistress or the, the, of, of a boarding house and they will have a chat with them and get a chance to have a look at the boarding house and meet some of our younger pupils. Um, and, and that's their assessment day. And then in making our decisions, we put together the ISEB test, um, the uh, reference and the and the two interviews that they have and that is as an all-round makes the, the our judgment because we're looking to build a real community of, of diverse people with diverse talents. Um, they do need to be academically able enough for our curriculum which is quite traditional um, so, but once they're there all round skills, different interests, different backgrounds, um, uh, different personalities. Uh, we are looking to build that, that diversity, um, uh, which makes our community really quite special. Uh, th thank you, Julia. Um, that is really good information for all of our viewers. Now, um, with all of our attendees today, many of us are based in Hong Kong. And, and the next question always comes up is, um, specifically for Hong Kong is how, how, is, um, how is the admission process? Uh, do you do any interviews uh, specifically here in Hong Kong or do Hong Kongers need to apply just like as anyone else? And then you also mentioned that uh, you are looking for diversity. So uh, a, a question that a lot of our viewers have been asking is what is your ratio between local and international students at Marlboro? Yeah. So um, we do ask, let's say under non-COVID conditions, all pupils to come to us. Um, the reason being, as I think I alluded to earlier on, we want to make sure that the child is as comfortable with us as we are with them. Um, so I wouldn't want to offer a child a place in a boarding school where they're going to come and live for two thirds of their lives if that child hasn't come, visited the college, met the staff and the other pupils and says, yep, I want to come to Morgan too. I'm really, I enjoyed my day. I think it's somewhere that I could thrive. Um, uh, so that's why we, um, we asked children to come to us. And I, and I do understand that for overseas parents, um, it, it is quite an ask, but I think it's, um, to be fair to the child and to the family, it's really, really important that they've, they've visited us and get a sense of, of, of what, what the college is about. Um, because it's such a business choosing the right senior school and it is a very personal thing. Um, so that, that's, that's, the first, that's the first thing. Um, in terms of our diversity, so we are 10%, we, we are building on this year on year, um, we are 10% non-UK national and nearly 20% live overseas. Some of those non-UK nationals will live in the UK and some of our overseas pupils are uh, British, but they live overseas, if you see what I mean. So it's a slightly complicated statistic. Um, 
but we are a very full boarding school so we are genuinely full at weekends um, we have perhaps 90 percent of our pupils with us we don't lock them away they can go home if they wish but they choose not to um, I live five minutes walk from school both my girls are full boarders they choose not to come home and be full boarders because they have fun at school and that's great um, and it is very much the culture at Marlborough is full boarding so I think if you're an overseas family looking for a school in the UK where your child can't come home every weekend because they, they, they're too far from home um, you know we provide that full boarding and that does generate a lot of overseas interest because they know that, that at the weekends their children are going to be um, happy and engaged and, and, and with their peer group um, so um, so we do so we have up to 20% to of our children just under 20% of our children living overseas um, and just to clarify for all of our viewers um, Year six, what is the age equivalent for that? Because in Hong Kong, our system is a little different. Of course, so they are 10 or, yeah, 10 or 11. 10 or 11. Yes. And then we would just go each year up. Um, so yes, year seven, exactly. 12, so, year nine exactly. Will be 13. Yeah, so they begin with us aged 13. They begin right. with us aged 13. Uh, thank you. And um, our next question is, um, I, uh, we did have a few questions regarding uh, the STEM teaching, which was what you were uh, presenting on. Now, how is the government support uh, for STEM teaching in the UK? Um, here in Hong Kong, uh, local government policy does support local schools. Uh, I think some of our viewers want to know how STEM teaching is incorporated and emphasized at Marlborough, uh, and if there's any government support for that as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're being an independent school. We, um, other than than following the exam board curriculum, we are to to, to a point free to um, to teach how we we wish. And and in a way, one of the limitations of our curriculum, as I, I suggested, is that actually um, teaching is it is still pigeonholed into those sciences. But what we have the freedom to do. Um, and particularly as a full boarding school where children are, are on site with us 24-7 and are therefore our days are, are much longer than they would be in a day school, um, is to look for those opportunities in the curriculum to offer the time and the space for collaboration outside the, the sort of teaching so through um, um, teaching um, design technology and through um, extension and optional sessions um, through having the labs open even at weekends where children can come in and work on their um, work on their projects um, and uh, even do their presentations and all those sorts of things that happen outside the normal um, perhaps the normal fairly short hours of the teaching day um, that allows us to build in the sort of collaboration um, that, is, that is harder to do um, in, in a much more sort of pressured environment where they've got to get through the requirements um, the requirements of the curriculum. Um, I mean there is quite a big STEM movement um, uh, in the UK, the UK with lots of um, speakers and, and, and projects and so on but the curriculum in itself has yet to really evolve um, completely that way and that's why um, we're sort of carving out space for it our, our, ourselves. Um. Sure, thank you. And I, I believe we probably just have uh, time for one more question. Now, um, a lot of our uh, viewers are uh, asking about the admissions process. Now, uh, how um, strict do you, does Marlboro abide uh, by your age cutoffs in your, in your application periods? Now, um, does that mean uh, we, if students miss the age cutoff by a few weeks or so, they would have to apply for their age, you know, um, their age date, or uh, is there any leeway? Uh, no, uh, certainly not by a few weeks. Certainly not by a few weeks. Um, the, and, and also it depends a little bit why, um, you know, why a child would be so, um, I would say, the only thing that, I mean, we, we are a little bit concerned about it. The, the, the reason being, again, that as a full boarding school, if I have a child who is, let's say, um, very young for their year that wants to come in, um, they will be in a full boarding environment with children well over a year older than them, um, right from the word go. And at 13, that can be a huge difference. Um, and I, I have concerns sometimes that a child that's very much too young for the year might struggle. And similarly, at the other end, if you have a child that turns 19, say, in the December before they leave us, and they're still in a boarding school where we're telling them to 
be in the boarding house at 10 o'clock at night and go to bed and all of these things. Um, and that can be quite tough if they're very much too old. Um, so we do offer some leeway um, of, of a, a little bit either side, but generally a little bit and not um, not too far out of our range because otherwise I think it becomes actually quite difficult um, for the child. It's such an immersive experience um, that if you're very out of kilter then I think it can be a little bit difficult. Um, but it's not an absolute cutoff. Great. Uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, I believe that's all the time we have with you for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. So before I let you go, do you have any parting words for our guests today? That, um, and anything about Marlboro College that you'd like to share for our viewers? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for listening. Um, and obviously, we'd love you to be in touch um, if, if you are interested. Um, I, I would encourage you, it is, schools are so personal. Um, I, I did have a, 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 a family visited us once and um, the English wasn't their first language, but they said, I think you need to smell a school to really understand it. And I know exactly what they meant. I think that's right. Um, I think there is something about visiting, um, uh, you know, narrow schools down, do your internet research, think about the sorts of schools that you might want and narrow it down. But I think it's really important to visit to get the feel of a school, um, a little bit like buying a house, there will be a right one. Um, you're telling me, yeah, actually, I, this, this just feels right. Um, and, and I think that's, that's probably um, really important. But um, good luck with the process and all the, the decisions that, um, that you have to make. And, and if we can see you at Marlborough and help you in any way, we'd be um, delighted to.